First thing, how do you say it? Some say Tollshunt, others Tolls Hunt, or just Darcy. That's its famous feature, bang in the middle. And so is the apple tree which bears a famous fruit, the Darcy Spice, English and old and tasty. It's the name adopted by the over 60s club in the village. And by seeing the children safely across the street, Margaret Miller helps to make sure there's a constant supply of future members coming along. She was born here, been a lollipop lady for a dozen years or more. Not a market garden, this, just the spread at the back of the bungalow where the Gretchis live, Maria and Orlando. He's Italian, came here in the 40s and decided to settle. Still keeps just a trace of his native accent. That's Marjorie Sayer. Care for a cup of tea, she said. Yes, please. And can we take your picture? Patch wasn't too keen, though. The may trees beside the pole were a gift. One bears red flowers, the other white. The parish authorities were so keen to protect them, they put them in this cage. Now, the trees are reliable. Year in, year out, they blossom. But there's no dancing on May the 1st, no ribbons round the pole, not for years. There couldn't be, because the trees are in the way. But even if they weren't, the skipping mites would very likely get mown down by the traffic. Would you believe Darcy's got no speed limit? What is it that makes girls go slightly balmy over horses? At the riding school and saddlery, they have no difficulty whatsoever in recruiting, if not an army, certainly a cavalry regiment of girls who turn up in all weathers and at unseemly early hours. And they don't jib at the jobs they get, clean or dirty. Riding is a serious business. With more people in the saddle than at any time in history, there's profit in tack. Val Hayes came here first as a rider and finished up as a partner. Oh, it's delightful, isn't it? I've often wondered, actually, if uh, horse riders are a bit like football fans and go for the colours of yeah. their favourite owner. Nice yeah. <laughs> Here's a nice little earner, the Joddy Clip. Stops Jodpers riding up. They make these here and sell thousands. They do a spot of tailoring, too. Basically, what we try to do is make a, a linen pattern so that, um, with this shape, we can work it out. Bespoke for a moke. Jenny's sagged so much in the middle during her 50 or more years that only a rug made to measure will fit. Vizian Banyard owns Jenny, learned to ride on her, but nobody rides Jenny now. By the way, her spinal sag isn't an injury, just old age. The measurements taken, Jenny's rug will be made up here by Marilyn or Christine. The saddlery and stables are run jointly by Val and her partner, Jerry Munson. He's a one-time fruit and veg wholesaler turned disc jockey. And now... Well, you retreated from um, showbiz, effectively, to go full-time into horses. What made you make the changeover? This was my hobby, and then it expanded into a business, you see. And now, my hobby has been taken over by this business of horses. And so it's been a great... Well, I've enjoyed every bit of it. When it comes to dealing with horses, is it a matter of um, innate skill or is it uh, acquired knowledge and experience? I often ask myself that question because one tends to be able to look at any situation in a horse and you feel that you know the answer and touch wood, I'm nearly always right. And I'll tell you a very short story about a, a, a situation we had here where a 
large black mare that I've got, she managed to consume a fair amount of sugar beet pulp, which is, it has to be soaked prior to feeding. In the afternoon, we decided that you know, the, sort of the situation was beyond redemption. We were going to lose this horse. And so I came up with the idea that we would uh, repipe the horse and he would have to come out the way that it went in, which um, Wicks, the vet, was a little bit apprehensive about. But I said, well, the horse is going to die. It's got to come out. So with the aid of a hoover, we sucked it back up through the nostrils the way it went in, and the horse is alive today. The old rectory, though it's really the former rectory. Jeff Wines bought it, and he's restoring it. He's not stopping short at the house. The garden is huge. There were fruit and vegetables in sufficient quantity to support bygone clerics and their households year after year. It was even more of a jungle than this when the Wines family moved in. The aim is to recreate the garden pretty much as the Victorians would have it. Jeff's getting advice from Sharon Hosegood and Vince Marley. Well, I think we're going to need some very careful tree surgery. Um, the tree is quite top heavy. Well, there's some damaged stems, but uh, nothing that a good tree surgeon couldn't cure. Vince lectures in landscape design at Rittle College. Sharon is Malden District Council's tree person. Before the planting, there's the paperwork to discuss. Some of Vince's students have been mulling over the scheme. <laughs> this is a model, effectively, of what you're proposing to do here, Vince? Not necessarily so. I'm just showing Jeff an example of a Victorian garden. Um, because the house is early 19th century and these plans show some of the architectural and design features that were mostly introduced in the Victorian period. Do you like what you see, Jack? I'm not too sure. There seems to be an awful lot of, of, of gravel and, and hard surfaces. Um, but if you look around you here, we've got trees all the way around the edges and they'll be preserved and that's important because it will complement the garden and we're in a conservation area, so all the trees are protected. To keep it authentic, there can't be anything in the way of modern varieties, trees and shrubs which the Victorians would never have known. But there's no such restriction on the present incumbent's garden. The church commissioners built him a more manageable modern place across the road. The vicar of St Nicholas is a one-time post office worker who moved with his wife Leslie and their children from a tough London parish. The Reverend Paul Southern. We've had to learn uh, what uh, makes life different in the country. People's joys and sorrows uh, are much the same wherever they live, but they're very much affected by that. So I've had to tune in a little bit to that. But I think people's needs uh, are important and, and very basic usually. Things, things like loneliness and being supported and I like to think that uh, I'm, I'm here and available for people to talk to me if they want to. You're both uh, urban types. How does um, a town parish compare with the country? Well, I'm, I'm very happy living here. It took me about 24 hours <laughs> to feel very much part of things. Yes. People have been very kind um, and accepted us, even though we're not country folk. Uh, you work as a team, but of course you are the clergyman, you're the clerk in holy orders, and you're the one who wears the badge, but you're right. not wearing it ah. today. Yes. It's easy for me around the village because everyone knows, or most people know, uh, who I am. I wear my badge on Sundays. Uh, I think uh, many people find uh, it's an important thing for me to to dress as a clergyman, to be seen as a clergyman, uh, then there it is uh, with that. But in my day-to-day -day, uh, around the village work, I, d I feel I don't really need to, um, to do that. Darcy's little church of St Nicholas is country quiet, or at least as much as passing traffic allows. But in September 1985, the church and graveyard were packed for the double funeral of Neville and June Bamber. They and their twin grandsons were all shot dead. At first, it was believed their daughter, Sheila, the twins' mother, had done it before turning the gun on herself. The unbearable grief of Jeremy Bamber was evident and understandable. The inheritance of White House Farm and an estate worth around half a million pounds was hardly consolation. 
But then came doubts. The police investigation was found to be, to say the least, inadequate. New evidence turned up and Jeremy Bamber was arrested and charged with all five murders. He was tried, found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. People spoke well of the Bambers. Neville was a JP and regular churchgoer. June was a church warden here. The porch lamp is a memorial to them. Darcy once had lots of little shops, enough to serve modest local needs, but the tobacconists and the forge are private houses now, like most of the rest. Houseplants thrive where once there were displays of domestic items, all that a well-run household could desire, and where courtesy and kind words were part of the stock in trade. Notice the patriotic streamers and bunting. The year is 1953. Darcy is en fête to celebrate the dawn of the new Elizabethan age. The village crowned its own queen, who presided over the pageantry and the parade. But the throng around the Maypole to see it pass was a bit on the thin side. It didn't matter, though. Those who were there to applaud were likely dressed up and taking part, making the most of it before the day moved on and real life came back to Darcy. That's one of Osborne's buses. There aren't many passengers aboard at this time of day, but Colin Quilter takes care of an important consignment, the Salter Bag. It's on its way to Tollsbury, Darcy's neighbour on the river. The Salter Bag is a daily reminder of a one-time general practitioner in Darcy. There's no dispensary there, so prescriptions have to be sent each morning to Tollsbury to be made up. Dr. Salter left money to pay for the service, and seven trustees, headed by the Bishop of Colchester, no less, administer it. Osborne's has been the local bus company for years, since the founder, George Osborne, graduated from a horse and cart. He seldom recruited drivers and conductors, they say. He just increased the family to cope. The old post office is one of the prettiest houses in Darcy. At the back is what used to be the telephone exchange, but the clatter and chatter of the routing mechanisms ceased when the electronic revolution made the old equipment redundant. It was ideal for the extension of the pottery run by June Smith. So in came the wheel and the kiln. It was handy being married to a man who makes them. The old post office is now the shop and showroom, not only for what June makes, but also the work of others. There's been a sort of pottery explosion. You find them everywhere, so competition is keen. Survival depends on tasteful presentation, creating a climate where people want to buy, and on being different. You just have to try and find something that nobody else is making or adapt it to your own style. Is it a matter of uh, market research or intuition or what? A little bit of both, I think. Um, lots of ideas come from other people. If they can't find a certain item, they ask me to make it, and then I adapt it to my own style, and then that starts up a whole new idea. Because one speciality of yours is, I'm not quite sure what you call them, but those, those lamps. Yes, they're aromatic oil burners, and that actually came from one of my customers who wanted some oil burners, but wanted them to be a little bit different. So I make them on the wheel, and then add the animals to make them a little bit unique. Yeah. Is, uh, is there a good market for that sort of thing? Oh, very much so at the moment. It's certainly a trend. Lots of people are using them for the aromatherapy essential oils, and that's a very growing market at the moment. <laughs> Next door to the pottery is the Queen's Head. Rain threatens and darkness, but it really is time they use the patonk pitch. It's lain idle long enough, so they try it. The landlord stands by with the rules just in case. Yep. Nice shot, Scott. Hey, boy. Right. Oh, nice shot. Excellent. You're going to say beginner's luck? <laughs> if they did, they'd be wrong. But it's as well the stakes aren't too high on this game. A genial cove called Paul Johnson mans the pumps at the Queen's Head with Hazel, the missus. The public's a marvellous bar 
kept pretty much as it has been since the 40s. Not comfortable in the sense of being comfy, the seats are hard, spartan even. It's comfort of a different kind. Mick and Nicholas Smee respond to it, especially Mick. He's a connoisseur of pubs, and not only for what they fill the glasses with. Mick's not the first painter to find a rich subject in bars. You have to admit that not only do pubs make good pictures, but the initial research, the sketches from which the paintings are made, are done in very agreeable conditions. Pint in one hand, pencil in the other. Mick's studio is in the back room of the one-time general store, the one with all those plants in the window. He's working at the moment to complete an exhibition, and when the brush falters, the Queen's head is just over the road. In a room even farther to the back of the house, Nicola plies a brush as well. But where Mick's figures inhabit real pubs and raise real glasses, her characters inhabit her head. She illustrates children's books. Indeed, she's writing them these days as well. Stories of few words to be read over and over again. The old shop is sitting room and gallery combined. I was actually looking for a house in Suffolk and stopped here and uh, popped over the road and this, this house had been empty for some two years. Three years, maybe. Uh, and uh, the bar, the particular bar, and the location of the house seemed quite, quite a good uh, location. Do you actually enjoy um, rebuilding a ruin? Uh, I did at the time, in 1976 I did, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Why not? <laughs> um, I'm older, wiser, <laughs> and I haven't got the money. Because each of you um, does very different work. Nicola, you work on a very small scale, whereas Mick, you work on a large scale. Do you find that you can actually assist each other technically? Well, we're, it's good because we make each other coffee occasionally and come in and see what the other's doing. And We don't really interfere much, but we can ask each other's opinion. And that's a help. So, it sometimes has devastating results. I don't like that, which is um, difficult to cope with sometimes. There's that apple again, the Darcy Spice. It adorns the village hall. The variety troupe is planning a show. Could put something in, couldn't we? Something like that. What do you reckon, Rayleigh? I think we've done one or two. Well, we can't have the can can or anything like that. You could dance that as actually, you could do that as part of the. That's the way of these things. Current productions are checked now and then by recollections of past triumphs. And why not? They're in it for the entertainment when all is said and done. Anne Hayes is briefing Gerald and Belle of Darcy Furniture on the way she wants her kitchen. It's a 40s house and she wants built-in units to suit. Gerald and Belle are just the men for the job. They use basic designs and are skillful in adapting them to suit any room, any shape. It's a personal service. That runs as sweetly as the proverbial nut. Well, we do try, you know, we do try. Do you take enormous pride in the craft part of it? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, it's, um, it's a way of life in a sense, you know, because you, um, you it is, it is more, it's not just earning a living, you know. I, I always say to me, mate, you know, you spend most of your time at work, so you might as well be doing something you enjoy as well. Because pretty well everything uh, around here is antique style. Don't you ever get fed up with it? No, not really, because that's, that's, you know, that's where our interest lies. Um, there the, are the lots of people doing the plainer furniture, whereas we like to stick to the old Victorian and the antique styles, because that's, that's where our first love is. It's mid-afternoon and the bag is back. Ivor Reynolds is a welcome sight to Darcyites with coughs and sneezes and sundry diseases. Prescriptions have been deciphered and the bag's been filled with medicines. 
Maureen Holding dispenses the contents. She's worked in the shop for over 20 years, and it looks like being a job for life, or as long as she wants it. Her daughter, Debbie, has just bought the business. Bye. The good doctor lived here, but someone more widely famous followed. Darcy was home to Marjorie and her husband, Pip Youngman Carter, editor of The Tattler. It was, and is, home to her surviving sister, Joyce. Marjorie was a prolific writer. Her detective stories and her hero, Campion, are known across the world in many languages. Joyce managed Marjorie, and still does. Uh, she used to sit in the front, of, uh, front room at Darcy House, which was actually the dining room, at a table, and people would stop and chat the whole time as they walked by. And she found that uh, very interesting and also got to know people. And of course she wrote all about this in her book, The Open Heart. And then it was in 55 that I came here and took up really to be a bit of a dog's body around the place, but to keep the uh, wheels oiled and to try to protect so that people can get on with their work. Was she a very disciplined worker in the sense of um, getting to the desk by a certain time of day? No, 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 no. She did it when she felt like it. And, and, but often, it, not only did she have to feel, it, she had to do it when we needed the money. When, she, when she wrote things, yes. did, did she try them out on you? Only, yes. Uh, sometimes she would say, well, usually we, we'd say, you know, got anything to read, you know what I mean? Let's, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's hear it. You live here surrounded by reminders of uh, Marjorie. Do you miss her? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, it would, have been, it would be great fun if she were here now. Yes. Acres of land in and around Darcy become heavy with fruit each year, most of it destined for Wilkins Jam Factory at Tiptree. Summer brings the pickers who make camp and, on the principle of a change being as good as a rest, climb ladders for relaxation. Peter Wilkin, chairman and managing director, drops in to say hello to this jolly lot. It's a holiday with Faye. <laughs> Working holiday. And it's a free site, and we get paid for picking fruit. So when we retired, right, that's four months for us, and it's been beautiful, and we love it. We've been coming out for 12 or 13 years, I think, since I retired. It gives you something to do. It's better than just sitting at home doing nothing. It's a decent pick this year, up to now, like. But uh, we've, we've had it a lot heavier other years, like. Um... My, my, my forebears were, in fact, general farmers here. They weren't particularly fruit farmers, although they used to grow a certain amount of fruit. But um, my great-grandfather started the business. Um, it was prompted, I believe, by a speech made by Mr. Gladstone extolling the virtues of jam making. And uh, so he got into, into doing it, and I think the fruit growing really spread from there. Now, in this age of uh, amalgamations, takeovers and what have you, it is novel to see a member of the original family still in charge of a family firm. Well, yes, I suppose it is unusual, really, but um, we value our independence very highly. So we we'll continue to be independent as long as we possibly can. Will there always be uh, a Wilkin in charge of Wilkins? I don't think so, no, I'm afraid, because there aren't any other members of the family coming into the business, but we're hoping to um, set up an arrangement whereby the employees actually own the company, and it will, so it remains a an independent concern, actually, in Tiptree. When Mr Wilkins finished with the fields, he says, right, help yourselves. So it's obvious what they're going to do with fruit and they pick it in for themselves. They make jam with it. So it's Wilkins' jam, isn't it? <laughs>